can continue with the wild robot part 19. Uh, when we left off spring had come to the island and Roz found out why Rockmouth the pike was so grouchy. He had been trapped in the pond when the uh, beavers had built their dam and he belonged in the river. So Roz carried him across the island to the river and Bright Bill returned with all the other geese. Okay. Chapter 63, The Journey. After months of separation, Roz and Bright Bill, mother and son, were together again. And they had so much catching up to do. They went into the nest and the robot built a fire. Then the goose gazed into the flames and told the story of his winter. And this is what he said. We spent the whole first day of our migration flying over the ocean. It seemed like the ocean would go on forever. But just when the flock was getting tired, Longneck pointed to some tiny islands on the horizon. We flew down to one of the islands and ate dune grass and rested our wings. After a few days of hopping from island to island, we reached the mainland and continued over fields and forests. And then the snow began to fall. I'd never seen snow before, and at first I thought it was beautiful, but it just kept coming. The others explained that the snow was early, that we were never supposed to see it, but there, but there it was, piling up around us as we tried to sleep at night. Longneck worried that the weakest geese wouldn't survive, and he was right. We lost old Whitefoot to that very first snowstorm. We tried to fly around the, the snowy weather, but we got completely lost and the weather became even worse. Lakes and ponds and rivers began freezing over. We couldn't find food or water, so we ate snow and that only made us colder. We had trouble cleaning ourselves and our feathers became dirty and heavy. The flock was in bad shape, but Longnap kept us moving. We are geese, he squawked, and geese keep moving. One day we were struggling through a snow shower when we saw someone, something called a farm. It had perfectly square fields and enormous building and stomping her way through the farm was a robot. She looked just like you, Ma. Longneck sent me over to speak to the robot, but I couldn't understand anything she said. So I just followed her through the farm and around a corner and then I saw something I never expected. Plants bright colorful plants. I didn't understand how plants could live in such cold weather, but when I saw that they were actually inside a building, I, leaned, I learned later that that building was called a greenhouse and it had clear walls made of something called glass. The robot pressed a button on the wall and a door slid open and warm air rushed, came rushing out. I hadn't felt warmth in so long I had forgot, I, I, had, I just had to follow her inside. Ma, it was like summer in there. The air was warm and sweet and sticky, and there were rows and rows of different plants. The robot didn't pay any attention to me, so I wandered through the greenhouse, nibbling on leaves and drinking from puddles. Then I heard a scratchy voice behind me. If I were younger, I would have killed you by now. I spun around, and there was an old cat. She walked on stiff legs, and her fur was gray and clumpy. The cat's name was Snooks, and she didn't seem very nice. But then she saw the other geese out in the cold with their faces presses, pressed against the glass, and she told me how to open the door. You can rest here, said Snooks, as the flock hurried in. But stay out of sight. The humans aren't as friendly as me. None of us knew what humans were, but we didn't care. We were just happy to be out of the cold. Loudwing was so happy she cried. The flock drank and ate and bathed and slept and stayed out of the way. Snook showed us where to leave our droppings so they wouldn't be noticed. And for a few days, the greenhouse was our home. Once or twice a day, the robot would go outside and return with a box or a bag. But most of the time, she stayed inside and quietly worked on the plants. There was a barn that I had to, there was a barn that I just had to explore. It was filled with animals and machines and piles of straw and two robots. One robot was fixing a broken door when I walked in. 
She was using a, a loud spinning tool called a saw. She pushed the saw through a long piece of wood and dust shot into the air. Everything was going smoothly until she saw, until the saw suddenly lurched forward and sliced right through three of the robot's fingers. But she was fine. A minute later, there was a whoomp sound as she popped on a new hand. Then she went right back to using the saw again. The other robot worked with the animals, chickens, sheep, pigs, and cows. They were all in cages. The chickens kept asking me how I'd gotten out of my cage. I was explaining that I'd never had a cage when I heard panicked squawks coming from the greenhouse. I ran back and found that a human had discovered the flock. We didn't know what he was saying, but he looked really angry. Longneck tried to defend us. He got in front and spread his wings and honked, but the human wasn't afraid. He pulled out a shiny stick and pointed it right at Longneck. Snook hissed, look out, he's got a rifle. Suddenly, a bright beam of light shot out from the rifle and Longneck slumped to the floor. He was dead, Mom. The flock was so scared, we fluttered around and honked and knocked over plants, but the human kept moving towards us pointing his rifle, so I pecked the button to open the door and we ran outside into the cold and flew away from there as fast as we could. There's a human with the rifle. Without long neck, the flock needed a new leader. Everyone wanted me to lead. I didn't know what to do, so I started to, by repeating long neck's words, I squawked, we are geese and geese keep going. Then I took the point and the flock spread out behind me. The weather had us all turned around and nobody knew which way to go. So I just led us straight south. We saw more robots and humans and buildings, but we didn't stop. We knew we were way off course when we saw the ocean again, but at least it was a little warmer by the water. So I decided to follow the coastline for a while. There were more buildings by the coast. Most of them were on land, but some were in the ocean. The ocean buildings were dirty and crumbled and, and leaning in different directions. They weren't many humans or robots in those buildings, only sea creatures. We saw ships on the water. We saw ships on the land. We even saw ships in the air. They buzzed through the sky like giant dragonflies. And then, and w then we reached a place called the city where thousands of buildings and robots and humans and ships were all close together. Then we stopped, when we stopped to rest on a rooftop, we met a friendly pigeon named Graybeak. She had grown up there, so she knew everything about the city. She flew us over towers and under bridges and kept us away from all the buzzing airships. And everywhere we went, there were robots. Some of the city robots were just like you, Ma but others crawled on six, le six legs or rolled on wheels or slid up and down the sides of buildings. Some robots were really small and some were really big. They moved things and cleaned things and built things and did every kind of job you can think of. Gray Beak brought us down to a ledge on the side of a building and told us to look through the windows. Inside was a family of humans and they had a Roz robot. When we looked into other buildings, we saw other humans with other robots. Every human seemed to have a robot. I told Graybeak about you, Ma, and she wanted to show us one place. We flew out to the ledge of the city. To the, we flew out to the edge of the city to a really big building called a factory. Graybeak brought us to the roof windows and we looked down into the factory and saw machines building sparkling heads and torsos and limbs. The factory was building robots. There's the factory. A machine held up a robot torso and put two legs under it and they snapped into place. It put feet under the legs and they snapped into place. It snapped arms into the shoulders and snapped hands into the arms. A leg was snapped onto the top. A head was snapped onto the top and the robot was finished. Ma, the robot looked just like you. I think that factory is where you were built. I wanted to watch more robots being built, but it started snowing again. Uh, snowing again. So we said goodbye to Graybeak and continued flying south. 
We saw fewer robots and humans in buildings and ships. The air became warmer and the snow disappeared. We started seeing other flocks of geese in the sky. So we followed them to the middle of a wide grassy field where there was a lake and hundreds of other geese. We had finally reached the wintering grounds. After all we'd been through together, our flock had become very close. We kept to ourselves, eating and resting and remembering the geese we'd lost. But after a few weeks, we began to mingle with the other flocks. We met geese from all over the world, and they told us all about their homes and their migrations and their troubles with the winter weather. Every flock had lost geese on the way there. A few flocks didn't make it at all. Before we knew it, the early spring flowers were poking up, and it was time to fly home. We followed the usual migration route north. We flew over fields and forests and hills, but we didn't see any signs of humans or robots, and that was fine with us. Eventually, we reached the ocean, and then our island, and then our pond, and then I saw you. We're going to leave it there. That was part 19 of The Wild Robot.